So, welcome back to the Bone Physiology playlist where we're talking about osseous physiology. So, in the last video, we talked about the very basics of bone physiology and bone structure, and we mentioned at least that there are specialized cells that exist in the bone and around the bone called osteoblasts and osteoclasts that basically carry out the physiology and the maintenance of bone health. And we mentioned that osteoblasts build up bone, and so what they do is they synthesize the bone extracellular matrix, which includes the hydroxyapatite that we will discuss in a few minutes, and then it also, those cells also facilitate the synthesis of collagen. And we mentioned that the hydroxyapatite gives bones its hardness and then the collagen is what gives the bones its tensile strength and its, re its ability to resist tension in either direction on the bone. And when we look at bone physiology and bone growth, um, we need several things to make the bone grow and certainly this is a non-exhaustive list. Um, number one, we're going to need calcium cations. The calcium um, is, what is what makes up a very large component of the hydroxyapatite. We'll look at the chemical formula for that in a few minutes. We're also going to require a sufficient amount of adenosine triphosphate that we're going to get through the electron transport chain that we talked about on the previous exam. Also, osteoblasts, which is the topic of this video, synthesize an extracellular matrix protein called collagen. And then as you can see, we're going to need some various other things. Obviously, to make enzymes like alkaline phosphatase, uh, we're going to need amino acids. So the amino acids will be used to make those enzymes. And of course, the amino acids will also be used to make the collagen. Okay, we're also going to see some other enzymes here and there like carbonic anhydrase that's used by the bone tissue to essentially uh, facilitate the carbonation of a protein called osteocalcin, which is actually what we're about to look at. So all these things in general are required for bone maintenance. So this right here, this is actually a rather imposing figure, but what we're going to do is we're going to break it down one step at a time. So the first thing we're going to worry about is I'm going to draw this dashed line right here, and what we're going to do is we're going to separate this picture into a left and right half. Okay, so this right here is the left side. This is the initial part of the hydroxyapatite synthesis, and that's what we're looking at. This, per, this molecule over here, it's really sort of a polymer over here that I'm circling in blue. That's hydroxyapatite, or at least it's a representation of it. Now, in order to synthesize hydroxyapatite onto the bone, we're going to have to use two things. Number one, we're going to have to use this protein, which I'll circle in red. It's referred to as osteocalcin. Osteocalcin is a protein that's responsible for uh, providing the, the synthetic handle onto which the hydroxyapatite is made. And then we're also going to have this that I'm highlighting in yellow. We're also going to have calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonate, um, at least the carbonate component, will not be there in the end, but it's used to cause precipitation of calcium and phosphate onto the osteocalcin. Okay, so the very first part, like I mentioned, is we have to synthesize this osteocalcin, and that's going to require amino acids. And then osteocalcin will essentially be deposited onto the bone itself, okay? And onto the osteocalcin, we're going to stick this uh, precipitated calcium carbonate onto it. And the way we're going to make the calcium carbonate is, number one, we're going to need calcium. I think that's pretty obvious. Calcium is the cation in this, uh, in this crystalline structure of calcium carbonate. And then there's an enzyme here that's going to exist extracellularly and also intracellularly. This enzyme, which is abbreviated here as CA, this is called carbonic anhydrase. So this enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. And carbonic anhydrase is going to take carbon dioxide and water, H2O, and it's going to combine them to essentially make this molecule called bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a very important molecule in acid-base balance, which we'll talk about in ANP2, but this particular molecule is also used in the initial stages of hydroxyapatite synthesis. And this particular molecule, bicarbonate, can exist both outside the cell and inside the cell, and there are transporters in both cases to move it between 
the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And in general, it's an equilibrium-based transport. But in any case, the calcium is going to precipitate with the bicarbonate onto this osteocalcin. So here we have the bicarbonate precipitating onto the osteocalcin along with this calcium cation. And so what we end up generating basically in step one is we generate a calcium carbonate crystalline structure precipitated onto the osteocalcin. And that's step one of the synthesis of hydroxyapatite. So let's, let's actually go to the next slide. And we're basically going to paraphrase this in words. Carbonic, carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme, like we said. It's both cytosolic and extracellular. And it catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into this molecule, which is referred to as bicarbonate, HCO3 minus. Now, when bicarbonate precipitates, it's not actually in the bicarbonate form. It's actually going to give up this proton, in which case, if HCO3 minus bicarbonate gives up the proton, you're going to be left with a molecule referred to as carbonate, CO3 2 minus. And it turns out that this molecule of carbonate is actually the direct molecule that's going to precipitate with the calcium cation, Ca2 plus, on the osteocalcin. Okay, so you get this calcium carbonate. So carbonate complexes with calcium to form precipitated calcium carbonate in the solid state. And calcium carbonate deposits on the osteocalcin, a protein that facilitates calcification, the process of synthesis of hydroxyapatite. And like we said, the calcium carbonate is the base off of which the hydroxyapatite will be built. Okay, so let me scroll down here. Okay, and in general, what's going to happen is we're going to require a cell, which is basically shown right here. This cell is called an osteoblast. And the way people typically remember osteoblast is they look at the B in here in osteoblast and they say, well, then it must build the bone. Okay, so osteoblasts build the bone and they do it in two ways. Number one, they synthesize collagen, which is not going to be dealt with much in this video. And then number two, they synthesize the hydroxy, hydroxyapatite. Of course, I'm abbreviating it there. Okay. And so we're going to talk about how they do that. And let's actually jump to this slide very quickly. Osteopla osteoblasts, like we said, deposit the hydroxyapatite that increases the bone mineral density of osseous tissue. In fact, if we take this micrograph of the bone being made, we notice the cell that's labeled here is B, which is a, certainly a smaller cell than A. This is the osteoblast. And in the last video, we talked about their cell lineage. This up here, which I'll circle in green, this is called the osteoclast. And as you can see, it's much bigger. And that's because osteoclasts are derived from a different lineage. They're derived from macrophages that are specialized to hang out in bone cells and catabolize the bone. And like we said, osteoblasts, they biosynthesize collagen using methods discussed in the collagen lecture, okay, which is certainly on YouTube right now. Now, one of the things that's really important about the osteoblasts is they express a very important enzyme, and this enzyme is referred to as alkaline phosphatase. So certainly the osteoblasts have ribosomes that we talked about on the last exam material, so they have these ribosomes, and the ribosomes synthesize this enzyme known as alkaline phosphatase, and in this particular picture they abbreviate that as ALP, alkaline phosphatase. And they also synthesize another enzyme, which is basically shown right here. This enzyme is called polyphosphate, polyphosphate kinase. And actually, we're going to look at a very general reaction of this, just so you can sort of get an intuition of what's happening. Okay? The idea is that we're going to synthesize a very long chain of phosphates, and then we're going to package that into a vesicle. So let's actually talk about how that occurs. And to do that, we'll sort of come over to this slide. So let's say, for example, that I have, let's say I have a chain. Of course, I'm not drawing the Lewis structures at all. Let's say I have a chain of four phosphates. Okay, And let's look at one reaction of polyphosphate kinase. We'll abbreviate that as PPK, polyphosphate kinase. But what's going to happen is I'm going to use a molecule. I'm going to use a molecule of adenosine triphosphate. 
and I'm going to transfer a phosphate onto this tetraphosphate. And so you could imagine if I transfer a phosphate onto this molecule, instead of having four now, I'm going to have five phosphates. And hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And so what's going to happen from there is once again, you're going to have another reaction of polyphosphate kinase, the phosphate donor is adenosine triphosphate. This is why we need it for bone synthesis. So now instead of having instead of having five phosphates, I'm actually adding another one. So now instead of five, you could imagine I'm going to have six. And this synthesis of the of this polyphosphate molecule is going to continue until you have this tremendously long polymer of phosphate molecules. And what it shows in this picture is that you have this process referred to as neutralization, where you have these metal cations, Me is metal, and they have different charges. They could have a plus one, maybe a plus two charge. And there are these green circles right here. And essentially what's going to happen is since phosphates are negatively charged, you can actually get metal cations that interact with the negative charges. And because charges, this is a little bit of physics, but a charge, which we abbreviate as Q, since it produces an electric field, and electric field is a vector, noted by this vector symbol, if you have a positively charged electric field and a negatively charged electric field, they can sort of cancel each other out. And so that's why you get neutralization once the polyphosphate starts interacting with all these metal cations. And I'm just drawing plus one charges, but they could also be plus two charges. Okay, so having said that, we get the process of neutralization. And once I get this polyphosphate with the metal cations inside a vesicle, so that's what this is, this structure right here is called a vesicle, the vesicle is going to exocytose. Okay, so here, right here, this is what we call, this is the polyphosphate with the metal cations, okay? And when it gets exocytosed, it's going to go along with this alkaline phosphatase, but nothing's going to happen yet. And what's going to happen when you get this, you get this polyphosphate with these green metal cations, when it gets dumped into the extracellular fluid here, these green cations are going to dissociate, right? And they're going to be replaced specifically by calcium ions. So the calcium cations are shown in these blue spheres. So notice the green metal cations, that could be a number of things. They essentially leave the polyphosphate and they, you know, dissociate away. And then those metal cations are essentially replaced by calcium. Okay. And the whole reason that we're synthesizing this polyphosphate is because it's really hard to transport phosphate by itself into the extracellular fluid. But if we polymerize it into a large polyphosphate polymer, it's really easy to dump it into the extracellular fluid. So now what's going to happen is this enzyme that we talked about, alkaline phosphatase, is essentially going to cleave apart the polyphosphate. So this is essentially what it's going to do. Imagine that, you know, imagine that the polyphosphate extends in that direction. So what's going to happen with alkaline phosphatase, so if we deal with alkaline phosphatase, I think it was ALP, right, alkaline phosphatase, it's going to cleave these bonds right here. This bond gets cleaved, then that one, then that one, and then that one, and that one, and all these, these phosphate, phosphate bonds get cleaved, and so I end up with some number N of phosphates, PO4, 3 minus. I end up with a whole bunch of these phosphates that are now in the extracellular fluid, okay? And that's a really important thing to understand, okay? So now that I've cleaved apart the polyphosphate into individual phosphates, not only do I have all of these phosphates, okay, but also there's calcium because when I cleave apart the polyphosphate, the calcium dissociates away from the phosphate. And here's where we're picking up again with the osteocalcin. So in the last part of the video, we looked at what happens to this calcium carbonate that now precipitates onto the ocal or osteocalcin. Now what's going to happen is the free calcium that we now have and the free phosphate that we now have, they're going to deposit or precipitate onto the carbonated osteocalcin. Okay, so that's what you see right here. You see the calcium and phosphate are now precipitating 
onto the carbonate or the calcium carbonate backbone of the osteocalcin crystalline structure. Okay, so let's kind of go on here and, and, and paraphrase this. Polyphosphate exchanges the metal ions for calcium ions, as calcium is the counter ion of phosphate, or at least it's one of the counter ions. And then alkaline phosphatase hydrolyzes phosphates off of the ends of polyphosphate, generating free calcium ions after the hydrolyses. Okay, and then inorganic phosphate. So the two things that you get out of this enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, is number one, you're going to get free phosphate. So in this case, it's going to be PO4, three minus. And then you're also going to get free calcium, Ca2+. Then the calcium and phosphate are going to precipitate onto the calcium carbonate bioseeds, which lie on top of the calcium carbonate apatite. So notice what's happening here. Like I circled here, let me put a star by it. The calcium and phosphate are precipitating onto this calcium carbonate crystalline backbone on the ocal. Okay, and then what's going to happen is let's kind of bracket this off right here. What's going to happen from there is the, you know, the phosphate and the calcium are going to continue to precipitate. And then finally, the last step is you get something referred to as decarbonation. So decarbonation. So the only reason the carbonate was there is to facilitate the precipitation of calcium and phosphate. And so the final step in this whole business is decarbonation. This means that the bicarbonate is released from the appetite and of course the calcium and phosphate that's already there. And so what we get is the final product, highlight this, we get hydroxyapatite. Okay, so one of the key things here is that the calcium carbonate was used to facilitate the precipitation of calcium and phosphate onto the ocal. And then the final step we get once all that is completed is decarbonation. And so actually what you're left with is a really important structure. And in general, we call it hydroxyapatite. And it has a chemical formula. Okay, it's CA10PO46OH2. And notice that if you're looking at this from a chemical perspective, um, it has an empirical formula. Sometimes they'll write it as CA5 and then PO43. Notice I'm just dividing all of these subscripts by 2 and then OH. So sometimes they'll write it like this. And this is the empirical formula, but in general, when you're looking at the crystalline structure, this is generally the one that you will use. This is the um, crystalline structure right here. And the hydroxyapatite is, let me do this in a different color, it's the mineralized and calcified component of bone. It gives bone its hardness, which is juxtaposed to collagen. Collagen has a different function. It gives bone tensile strength. And so if, if you don't have collagen synthesis, or it's at least it's reduced, the bone will become actually really flimsy and prone to fracture. And it's a well-established fact that people that um, don't eat enough amino acids, they have problems synthesizing proteins, and then collagen synthesis suffers. So not only does it have implications in the skin, but also the bone. And so people who have these collagen deficiencies, um, they're going to have increased risk of bone, bone fracture. Okay, And certainly with collagen synthesis, it requires ascorbate or vitamin C. And we certainly talked about that earlier on in a different lecture. So it requires vitamin C, which you typically refer to as ascorbate. I'll write that here. This is ascorbate. So certainly ascorbate deficiency can lead to bone problems because collagen is required for bone. And amino acid deficiency can lead to deficiency of collagen. So it's important to get all that stuff. And so all of these processes are carried out by a cell in general called an osteo blast and so hopefully you understand now that osteoblasts build the bone okay the b here is for build and hopefully now you have a little bit of an intuition of how that occurs in the next video we're going to go over the opposite function of how we catabolize bone and that's carried out by a cell referred to as an osteoclast kind of looks like a metroid from those samus games so hopefully that gave you a little bit of intuition see you in the next video